I'm here at MAGFest with swordsmith Alexei Ilya. Uh, Alexei Ilya, last name first. Thank you for speaking with me. I'd like to start by asking, is there um, a weapon here that you're most proud of and why? Well, presently at MAGFest, uh, my prou the weapons with which I'm most proud, we didn't bring them yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there are several. One of them was the sword we did for Kings of Avalon for the YouTube show Excalibur. Uh, that sword specifically gave me the opportunity to show why my title is an engraver amongst other disciplines because the blade was fully engraved, the pommel, everything. So that blade took me, that sword took me about a month to complete. Mm -hmm. uh, the, another sword was the one we made for Pearl Moker. For that, PA Works sent uh, Tamahagani from Japan to me to make the sword for the show. So that was another point of accomplishment. Now, how do you know when a weapon is complete or finished in your estimation? It's a very hard question to answer because there's always, after it is finished, so to speak, uh, there's always something you feel, oh, I could have done something else, oh, I should have polished it up a little bit better, so on and so forth. So, in a sense, none of them are complete because none of them are perfect in the eyes of the maker. What inspires your work? That is also a difficult question to answer. Sometimes the subject matter, when I'm a fan of something, that inspires me to go and complete the project. The other times, it is the material that I've worked with. When I work with traditional material, that itself serves as inspiration to do it justice. Um, and I suppose the third one, the sheer challenge, when the project is extremely difficult, and I know that there's like two or three more people uh, on this continent who can do it on time, so that becomes a challenge, sort of measuring thing. So, would you say there are any historical periods you prefer to work in? Or well, are? no, uh, there, there are not any, no historical periods I prefer to work in because I live in the 21st century historical period and I don't have an opportunity to work in any other. Or <laughs> work, uh, make weapons from that period, of, you know. Um, generally, I'm a big fan of the Japanese school of, uh, well, of the Japanese tradition of swordsmithing. Now, the reason why I'm a fan of them is because they're the only culture with a continuous history and uh, institution of appraising swords as swords and viewing them as artwork. So, they have a continuous tradition of establishing criteria for what counts as a beautiful sword as a well-made sword which all other cultures lost so you go to the Middle East where they're like daggers and sabers so on and so forth the blacksmith there is a profession that is not well respected at all the jeweler who makes all the fittings is a well respected profession the smith who makes the swords is not he's, he's always poor and he's rarely literate uh, same thing in India. I mean, most uh, places in the world, there's no continuous culture of appraising swords and viewing them as works of art in themselves. When you go to Japan, all the way from the 11th and 9th century, we have signed swords. It means the smith signed them. This shows us two things. That at the time, the smith was proud enough to sign their work, the buyer was appraising the work in its own right in order to demand the signed piece and the, the smith was literate because they knew kanji they knew how to write and a literate craftsman means that the craftsman is connected to the intellectual tradition of writing letters and reading books and that says a lot because 11th century that is when Europe and no smith in Europe with rare exceptions knew how to speak or write Latin and at the time most books were written in Latin so starting from 11 not actually early 9th century all the way to the present day there are continuous ways of looking at the sword 
as a piece of refinement and as a religious object. What is your most important weapon-making tool? Is there something special you need in your workspace? My library. Ah. Library of books. text or is it uh, illustrations? No, books. But do you... Uh, I, in my uh, life as a craftsman, the things that contributed the most to my ability of engraving or making swords or processing traditional materials uh, has always been my library of classical literature. Mm. Now, people might say, well, this is bold. Uh, you, you surely are tricking us. Huh. Well, that's false. And one of the most important questions someone pursuing any art form can answer to themselves, and this is the most important question in life, why do baseball players bench press? Why do they bench press? To become yes. stronger at their No, because swing? you don't need to bench press to be, to throw the ball. True. You don't need to bench press to uh, use the bat. But why do all baseball players bench press in the gym? You'll have to tell me. I don't know. Because it balances out one's own physique and when your body is well developed all throughout, it informs you as an athlete in one particular narrow discipline. Uh, if in Europe I would have asked why do soccer players bench press, right? Uh, Same thing. Uh, if you learn other languages, if you read literature of the time, if you read high art literature like Dostoevsky or the story of the Genji or uh, the dreams of the Red Chamber, uh, the great dialogue by Plato, what happens is you're training your mind how to think a certain way and expanding the horizons of concepts that otherwise you would have accepted as given. And that itself informs your eye and a way of thinking that helps guide your hands in almost every single thing you do physically. What languages uh, do you read in? I am read? currently studying Japanese. Uh, I'm very bad at it at the moment. I My native language is Russian. I speak fluent English and I'm relatively competent with French. Relatively. Don't don't try to catch me on that. <laughs> Is there an element of smithing that you enjoy working on most? And why is that? I enjoy working on two things most. First one, working on traditional materials in the charcoal forge specifically, not gas charcoal. I find the process meditative because it has to be. You're forced to focus on it. You cannot speed it up. Uh, you cannot cut corners. So it forces me in a certain kind of solitary confinement of the mind that is fairly relaxing when people are not distracting me. Uh, the second one, I enjoy um, engraving and chasing. So it, it's the, basically the goldsmiths. Uh, set of disciplines where you work on fittings and inlay gold into uh, iron or into copper and working with precious materials as well. Are those mainly solitary tasks or? I prefer them to be solitary. Okay. All right. I don't know if you have no, assistance. Yeah, okay. Or... Here's the thing. Uh, things that require a lot of attention, uh, I like when other people are not around as much uh -huh. to distract because attention. Uh, the second thing is. I have a plan for, for a specific project, for example, and very often I don't let anyone else touch it because it, they it will either mess up and then I have to start over and then I'm angry at them, <laughs> which is bad, right? Yeah. Even worse, if I mess up later, I will still blame them <laughs> and then I'm the asshole. <laughs> And that's also bad. Yeah. So I. That's why when I'm like when it's a serious project that I really care about, I avoid the other people touching. How did you start uh, weapons making, and why uh, continue? I needed a job in graduate school while I was studying philosophy. Uh, you, you know, you need a job in graduate school, right. and I needed a job that uh, where I make my own schedule, which is very important when you need to finish your thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I beat around the employment bush and found 
out from Kerry Stagmer that I can use his shop anytime. And before that, I was fairly competent as an armor, making high-end armor. So I was uh, using his shop, helping him out as a way of like paying for the use of the shop. And eventually, I started taking over s certain aspects of the sword production thing, and now I'm there. So what's the first piece of armor you created? The first piece of armor? Oh, I don't even remember now. Like, this oh, is really? a bad question. It's, it's, uh, probably... I'm just going to answer because that's the usual answer for anybody who does armor and chainmail shirt. Uh. That's probably the case. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that's the case. Uh, it might not be, but it's like I don't even remember. I've been doing it for a while, and yeah, it's all mixing up in my head now. How about the first blade? The first sword was a Polish saber, uh, and it was not very good. Wow. What what period time period? Was 17th that? century. I 17th. tried to go for 17th century. So all right. it, it was not very good. And what was your philosophy thesis? Okay, so in my program at American University, uh, my thesis was on the role of intellectual property uh, in Rawlsian justice. Uh, the argument was, okay, John Rawls in um, his later writings allows for a several just arrangements. One of them is a social democratic uh, political arrangement in a society. Uh, by definition, that uh, that necessitates that some means of production have to be publicly owned. He doesn't say how much, he doesn't say to what extent, he just says some. Uh, the problem is, what we learn from Karl Marx's Grundrisse is that uh, general knowledge is the most basic means, the, the general intellect, of basic means of production. So that has to be publicly owned. Now, Marx, although being very savvy about the role of technology in the political economy, never predicted the rate at which it be, uh, technology self-perpetuates and self-perfects. So, the intellectual, consequently, in a Rawlsian system of justice, if we take the Marxian insight seriously, uh, intellectual property should be treated as one of the primary goods. Not, not necessarily the property aspect of it, but the ability to create intellectual property. Now, the problem arises when 90% of economic transactions have to deal with what is known as intellectual property one way or another. And it becomes such that individuals in a political economy are capable of owning the majority of the general intellect, the things you need to make other things. And at a certain point, uh, the institution of intellectual property starts looking like some guy owning the right to all hammers. So no carpenter can make carpentry stuff, benches or uh, drawers or what have you, without paying the guy who owns the idea of the hammer. And in a Rosian system of justice, that is clearly unjust. So, um, this one part of my thesis, I did the economic uh, analysis uh, with several uh, regressions and uh, using as the background system of current intellectual property regime, the TRIPS uh, system. And it seems to be the case that there is no um, correlation between how well a country enforces intellectual proper, international intellectual property laws and how fast intellectual property sectors grow in that economy. Uh, the exception being if you take the state of Texas as if it's its own country because it owns more, uh, there are more patents registered in Texas than in, almost in the rest of the world combined. Uh, almost. It, it's something like that. It was a while ago. Uh, the exception is the state of Texas. But, uh, so, you, and if you're a good statistician, you do your analysis with the outlier and without the outlier, and just talk about the outlier. So, apparently there's no correlation between enforcement of intellectual property laws and economic growth and lack of its enforcement. 
Consequently, it doesn't really suffer, uh, the economy will not suffer tremendously by, from revising current intellectual property regimes to a more just arrangement. Uh, the practical proposal out of the thesis was to have the World Bank buy out some patents and give them out to uh, less fortunate countries to create their own industries, provided that there are conditions for limited export that way the pa original patent holders have an incentive to sell the patents being assured that there's no unfair competition in terms of the production end of it. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that shit. <laughs> it, was a, it was a multifaceted thesis that was going through several disciplines. So is how much is philosophy still a part of your life, you know, is it just... It always, it always is. Uh, okay. In regular jargon, philosophy is a very misused term. Everybody says, well, my philosophy to them is the blah, blah, blah. Like, no, that's not what philosophy means. Uh, uh, philosophy is a systematic pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, it's not just, you know, my philosophy. It's by definition public because all knowledge is public. So there's no such thing as personal philosophy. <laughs> right. it, it cannot. It's just like a personal language cannot exist. Right. Uh, so uh, anyway. All right. You can keep asking questions. Sure. I'm pretty sure I'm giving you more than you want. No, I I, I want to hear that. Yeah. Um, how did your first professional sale change your weapons making process? Did it, it change? Didn't. I don't. I don't no. even remember my first professional sale. I don't. Like I don't. I'm not very good at remembering these so sorts of things. It's not. It's not what I really. Yeah, I just. I don't. Do you remember any time in your your career where you well, thought, "Well, I have to change this"? Okay, he, he's like, I work in Baltimore Knife and Sword, so usually until three o'clock, I make stuff for Baltimore Knife and Sword. Yeah. Once three o'clock strikes, I use the shop to make stuff for myself uh -huh. <laughs> and do research. And the stuff that I'm unhappy about, I tell Matt, you know what, just sell it. Just yeah, just give me half of that sh money and just sell it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's it. So the things that I sell are the things that did not, not meet my aspirations. Uh, consequently, uh, the sale affects my production process uh, in the sense that, yep, that's not what I'm doing again. Screw that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hey, um, it's not. It's not quite right. All right. Uh, what role does the weapon maker have in society? Uh, hopefully none. Huh. Uh, right. I'm. I. I really am a pacifist in a sense. Uh, uh -huh. Like I don't watch violent movies and shows at all. I like romantic. I like romantic comedies, and so I hope the we weapon makers will be all out of jobs. That's my, like, out of jobs. Yeah. Screw that. And, like, making swords is kind of funny because no one uses swords, really, so it's not even really a weapon until you, you know, get in trouble with the police. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they're more like art objects. So, like, that's okay. But no, I don't, I'm not a weapons guy, really. Uh, paradoxically enough, I'm not. Uh, what movies, books, artwork, or other creative media in science fiction or fantasy have inspired you, if any? In fantasy, everybody was inspired by the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. Everybody in the Western world. That's undeniable. Including me, no matter what. No matter what I say, it, it has. In... I've been heavily uh, influenced by uh, Japanese science fiction in the medium of anime. Uh, I have particularly gotten a appreciation for Kill la Kill. Now, uh, a very astute viewer will notice that Kill la Kill art style is a copy of Italian futurism of the beginning of the 20th century. and. Considering the fascist background of the story, it actually works. It's a, it's a very well designed anime series. I cannot, like, begin. To, you cannot begin to overstate how that is the case. It's amazing. Uh, always Blade Runner. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, the movie and the um, do androids. Uh, Dream of robot. Robot, robot shape. I forgot oh, I the name. Yeah. <coughs> like she. 
uh, Zelazny's work was uh, really like great uh, food for the mind. Um, in what more of Bradbury is always a classic. No, no, like Martian Chronicle. I like the Martian Chronicles out of that. They, that really helped me get an appreciation for contemporary literature. Uh, okay, American contemporary literature. Because the uh, United States is uh, outside of the United States, not known for its literature. <laughs> uh, that's just the case. Like, um, like, nobody in France reads American literature. They read. Uh, English literature, French literature, Russian literature, even Japanese literature, Chinese literature, they don't generally read American literature. Uh, like, seriously. Uh, so, like, Ray Bradbury is one of the science fiction people who actually goes across cultures and actually gives something of value uh, across the pond, so to speak. Ghost in the Shell was amazing. Mm -hmm. When it came out in the 90s, it still is amazing when you watch it. The concept, the subtlety, it's brilliant. Um, anyway, though, that should answer. Yeah, are you familiar with the Russian uh, sci-fi sci authors? I think it's the Stanislav. Stanislav? Uh, yeah, they did Solaris. And yep, I'm perfectly familiar. Uh, I read the books. The, um, and the film by Tarkovsky still stands up. It's like, uh, yeah. So, um, what is there a weapon that you would especially like to create but haven't done so yet, and what is it? I would like to make two things. One would be uh, the divine jewel spear of heavens from the uh, first chapter of the Kojiki. And the second would be either one or both of Charlemagne's swords. Mm. All right. It you know, one of the sword, one of Charlemagne's swords was made in Russia. Ah. Yeah, the saber. Ah. He has two swords. Mm -hmm. uh, and might that happen in the future? Or is I don't know. I don't. Like, it's, it's a lot of gold I have to accrue to make that. Oh. All right. Um, well, that's all the questions I have. Any final thoughts or comments? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I think there's enough comments here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Please visit chrisalvarez.com for more cool stuff. You can also find my website and social media information in the podcast show notes. Thanks for listening and keep imagining the future.